Certainly it's good to be back with you again this evening for a continuation of our study. We're glad to have visitors with us. I know we have a few here from North Jackson where my wife and I are members. And uh, probably visitors from other places that I do not know. But whoever you are, we're glad you are here. Now, we have three nights upcoming. It's interesting, Brother Pack observed that we're halfway through. That's because there are six sessions, six lessons, three of them today. So that only leaves the three on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evening. But we want to encourage you to come back, and if you know someone that would benefit from these lessons, invite them, bring them with you. Let others know about our meeting, and when they come, I hope that we'll have something worthwhile for them to study. But we appreciate the presence of every one of you. And our theme throughout today has been the great cloud of witnesses. That language is taken from Hebrews <laughs> chapter 12 and verse 1. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And that is a reference to all of those heroes of the faith that are mentioned in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And there's a verse that I want to refer to in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, down about verse 32, that refers to some of the um, heroes other than by name. We have some that are mentioned by name. Two of them we talked about earlier today. We talked about Enoch. We talked about Moses. There are many others that are named in Hebrews chapter 11. But when you get down to verse 32, the writer of Hebrews says, What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. So he does not name them all, but he refers to a class of heroes that he refers to as the prophets. And I want to deal with one of those prophets in our study tonight. We're going to base our lesson on the 22nd chapter of the book of First Kings. And uh, Brother Pack indicated this uh, earlier today and then referred to it again a few moments ago. We are studying a prophet tonight that is not one of the best known. All of us have heard of Isaiah because one of our Old Testament books is named after Isaiah. Jeremiah, the prophet. We have the book of Jeremiah. Daniel, we have the book of Daniel. And then there are some prophets, even though they did not write a book, they're quite well known. Elijah and Elisha. But we're talking about a prophet tonight that is mentioned only briefly. And yet, in my judgment, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. And uh, the story is found, as I've suggested, in 1 Kings chapter 22. So I want to set the stage for this prophet and his work, and then talk about what he did, and uh, then for us to think about what that means for us. In 1 Kings chapter 22, we find that there is a meeting between the king of Israel and the king of Judah. So let me just begin by outlining what is involved there. You remember that at one time the kingdom of Israel was united. That is, there were 12 tribes of Israel. But they had a division. When the uh, Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. And Rehoboam decided the way to really emphasize his leadership 
was to get tough on the people. He increased their burdens, their taxes, and instead of strengthening the nation, it divided it. And so you had 10 tribes that lived and formed a northern kingdom and their king was named Jeroboam and then you had Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, with the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, down in the south. And the northern kingdom came to be known as Israel. That's what the entire nation had been called up to that time with the 12 tribes. But when the 10 tribes broke off, they were known as Israel, or sometimes they were known by the name of Ephraim. So after the division of the kingdom, if you read about Israel or you read about Ephraim, that is talking about the 10 tribes in the north. The tribes in the south under Rehoboam were known as Judah. That's the southern kingdom. So you have Israel, you have Judah. 10 tribes, two tribes. Once they were all together, 12 tribes. But now then you have a division between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And you'll see in a moment why it's important to have that little understanding as we proceed into the study of this particular prophet. In 1 Kings chapter 22, we read about how that the king in the northern kingdom desired to go up into battle against Syria. You know, I'm amazed sometimes when I'm reading in the Bible to discover these nations that are still around and you read about them nearly every day in your newspaper or on the news, on television. Think about that. They're the same nations that were having trouble back there even in Old Testament days. So in the first Kings chapter 22, I'll begin at verse two. It came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, so let's get that idea in our minds. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. That's the tribes down in the south the southern kingdom, came down to the king of Israel. That's the northern kingdom. So here you have Israel, Judah, and the kings come together for a meeting. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth Gilead is ours, and we be still and take it not out of the land of the king of Syria. You read about Syria every day. Still over there. Same nation. Existed all these years. Still fighting. Still at odds with Israel. So here you are way back in the Old Testament and you're reading about the very same nations that are in the news today. And here it is said that the king of Israel, by the way, Put this in your imagination just so we can follow along <coughs> what is said here. Syria was to the north of Israel. Israel was to the north of Judah. And Judah is the southernmost tribe. So if you just think about it in this way, you have Syria, Israel, the northern kingdom, Judah, the southern kingdom. Here they are almost in a line, north to south. And uh, the king of Israel, the northern tribe of God's people, wanted to go up in battle against Syria, their neighbor just to the north, and to reclaim some property that they felt belonged to them. But now the king of Israel doesn't want to do it by himself. He wants some help. That's why that he has Jehoshaphat up there, the king from the south. So listen to what goes on. 
The king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, now that's the king of Israel, the northern tribes, talking to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, the southern tribes. He said unto Jehoshaphat, Will thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses thy horses. So here they are talking about joining together, going into battle against Syria in order that they might reclaim their property known as Ramah Gilead. But let us read on. Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, by the way it has a name in here, but king of Israel at this time was Ahab. So you have Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And he's not named in here, but you have Syria up here, and uh, Ben-Hadad is the king up there. So these are the three kings of the three nations that are involved in the story that we're reading here in 1 Kings chapter 22. But now, here is where the plot thickens. In 1 Kings 22 and verse 5, Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Now, I have an idea that Jehoshaphat down there in the southern nation of Judah was a more religious man than Ahab. Ahab was not a very admirable character. And he's wanting to go in battle up here against the king of Syria. And he's asking Jehoshaphat to help him. And Jehoshaphat says, well, I'm willing to do it, but let's make an inquiry of the Lord. He wanted to know whether uh, the Lord would bless them as they went up in the battle against Syria. The king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle? or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now I want you to get this picture because the more we understand it, the more interesting this becomes. Here you have two kings meeting together, Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, southern tribes, Ahab the king of Israel, the northern tribes. Ahab wants to go up into battle against Syria, just to their north, in order to reclaim this property known as Ramoth Gilead. And he asked Jehoshaphat, will you help me? Will you go with me? And Jehoshaphat indicates that he will, or that he is willing to do so, but he raises that question, can we not inquire of the Lord about this matter? Well, Ahab is ready for that. He brings together 400 prophets. But the picture that we must bear in our minds is this. They were on his staff. You might say they were his prophets. They may have been paid. They were professionals. They were paid to say what the king wanted to hear. They, they're not speaking for God. They're not delivering the word of the Lord. They're saying what Ahab wanted them to say. So he asked of them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead? That's what Jehoshaphat had wanted to know. What does the Lord think about this? So here are these 400 prophets that are brought together by Ahab and he asked them, shall I go and battle up against Ramoth Gilead? And they all say, why yes, go up. For the Lord shall deliver it into the 
hand of the king. Now, that made Jehoshaphat suspicious. I sometimes, uh, in a humorous vein, compare it this way. If you had 400 preachers together and they everyone agreed on every point, would you not begin to wonder? <laughs> That's what happens here. 400 prophets, Ahab brought them together. They all agreed that he should go up into battle against Ramoth Gilead. That's what he wanted to hear. Because he desired to go up into battle against Syria. And he wanted Jehoshaphat from the south to help him. And Jehoshaphat said, what about a word from the Lord? And the 400 prophets came together and they said, yes. They answered the very way that old King Ahab wanted them to say. Now watch Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides? that we might inquire of him. Now get the idea here. He's got 400. They all agreed. They all said the same thing. They all said what Ahab wanted them to say. And it made Jehoshaphat suspicious. And the curious thing to me is, Jehoshaphat does not say what about 400 other prophets? No. He does not even say, what about 100 other prophets? No. He does not even ask for 10 other prophets. Jehoshaphat asked for one more. Now why? Well, he realized that Ahab had already brought together all of his staff of prophets, all of his professional prophets. He had them all together there, and they all said just what Ahab wanted them to say. And Jehoshaphat said, could I hear from one more? Is there not yet another of whom we may inquire? He knew that if there were one other prophet, it would not be one of that 400 professional prophets that Ahab had assembled together. Now listen to how Ahab answers him. Jehoshaphat said, Is there not yet another prophet of whom we may inquire? And the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man. Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. He said, well, there's one more. Yeah, there's, there's another prophet. His name is, some pronounce it Micaiah, some Micaiah. But there's one other prophet. But here's what they have said to him. But I hate him. For he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. In other words, I'd like to hear from that one other prophet. So here you have a great meeting. Two kings are there. All of their courts are assembled together. Ahab wanted Jehoshaphat to come up there and visit with him that he might persuade him to help when they went up into battle against Syria. Jehoshaphat <coughs> said, well, I'd like to know what the Lord says about this. Ahab brought his 400 prophets together and they all said, oh, go, go on up there. Yes, God will deliver it unto you. And now Jehoshaphat has said, well, wait a minute. 
400 prophets, they all sound just alike. Is there not one more? One more of whom we may inquire? Hey, absolutely, well, there's one, Micaiah, but I hate him. He doesn't say good things. All these 400 prophets, they knew where their bread was buttered. They wanted to answer what the king wanted. They wanted to say what they knew he desired for them to say. Now then, what about Micaiah? Oh, I don't like him. Well, now Jehoshaphat more than ever wants to hear from him. Then the king of Israel, that's Ahab, called an officer and said, Hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imlah. So realizing that in order to get Jehoshaphat lined up to help him in that battle, he knows he's going to have to hear from that one other prophet, Micaiah. You may not have even heard his name before. No Old Testament book by him. Not as famous as Isaiah, Jeremiah. But let me tell you this. By the time we finish what is said about Micaiah in this chapter, you're going to love him. He's going to be one of your favorite prophets as he is mine. Let's watch what happens. All they have sends a messenger down there to Micaiah's in order to fetch him and bring him back up there where they are, since Jehoshaphat wants to hear from him. So, um, verse 10 of 1 Kings 22, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria and all the prophets prophesied before them. That verse is in there to tell us this was a solemn occasion. They're dressed up in their kingly garments. They have on their robes. 400 prophets stretched out there before them to say what Ahab wants them to say. But now then they sent a messenger down there to Micaiah's house in order to fetch him and to bring him back up to this august assembly that we've read about. So now, I'm going to read to you what this messenger says when he gets down there to Micaiah's house. He says, all the prophets prophesy, saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. Now he tells them what these 400 prophets have all said. Here's Micaiah, one little fellow. One man by himself. Two kings, their royal court, 400 prophets of Ahab, and now then a messenger down here to talk to this one last prophet. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. One mouth meaning they all said the same thing. Now watch what he said. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them. And speak that which is good. This messenger that went down there was trying to look out for Micaiah. He said, if you know what is good for you, you're going to say the same thing they say. And he tells Micaiah what all of those 400 have said up there to please Ahab the king. And he said, I pray thee when you get up there, you 
say the same thing they said. Now then, I'm going to read you Micaiah's answer. It's found in 1 Kings 22 and verse 14. And it is one of my favorite verses. Not only in this chapter, it is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Old Ahab is waiting up there. Jehoshaphat is with him. 400 prophets have already told him, yes, go up into battle against Ben-Hadad of Syria. And now then they're inquiring of one other prophet, Micaiah. And the messenger has gone down to his house and told him, when you get up there, you better say the same thing they did. And here's Micaiah's answer. And Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Oh, don't you admire him. He's not intimidated by those two kings. He is not intimidated by those 400 false prophets that were on the paid staff of King Ahab of Israel. He's not intimidated by the messenger that comes down to his house and says if you know what's good for you you'll say the same thing they have all said he says as the Lord liveth whatsoever the Lord saith unto me that will I speak oh I love that that makes me admire old Micaiah he's not going to be pushed He's not going to be intimidated, but he is going to be faithful unto the Lord. Now, I've got a little something I want you to think about. You may have seen me get up a few minutes ago and walk over here in front of this table we call the Lord's table. I wanted to look at what it had inscribed on the front of it. It's impressed in the wood there. It's a little hard to read where you are sitting, but I walked up here close and looked at it, and I can tell you that inscribed in the front of that table are these words. This do in remembrance of me. That's good. That's what we do in the Lord's Supper. This do in remembrance of me. But now here's my question. What's inscribed right here? Nothing. I've always thought it was interesting that we have an inscription on the Lord's table. This do in remembrance of me. There's no inscription that I've ever seen in any of our pulpits. But if I could recommend any statement to be inscribed on the pulpits all across the land and country, it would be the words of Micaiah. Whatsoever the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Wouldn't that be a marvelous thing? What if every man that stands in the pulpit were to be guided by those words? <coughs> Whatsoever the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Doesn't matter whether everybody agrees, doesn't matter how much criticism one might receive for doing it. We're guided by what the Lord said. That's Micaiah. Now what I want you to remember in this regard is he was the only one. And that's the lesson that I want to bring to us tonight from one who is in that great 
cloud of witnesses. I want you and each of you and myself, I want all of us to be reminded of the fact that he took a stand for what was right even when he was the only one. Think how many times one of our young people has been in a school group and they all wanted to do something that was wrong and we had one student in there, a member of the church, that stood up against all of that and stood alone. I want you to think about somebody at a workplace, man or woman, engaged in their work or their profession, and everybody else is doing something wrong. Everybody else may be cheating on something, but that one person says, I will not go along with it. That's Makai. That's the lesson I want us to see. And the lesson that I derive from Makai is this, I will stand for the right if I am the only one. If everybody else goes the other way, if everybody else does something that is wrong, I will do what is right. Oh, I love that. When old Micaiah went up there and stood before Ahab and Jehoshaphat, he disagreed with the prophets. He said, if you go up in the battle against Syria, the people are going to be left as sheep without a shepherd. And I'm not spending a lot of time on this other than just to finish out the story. When Ahab went up there, he was so afraid something might happen to him after he heard the prophecy of Micaiah that he did not wear his royal garments. He did not wear his kingly outfit. He dressed like one of the common soldiers. And we're told that a soldier on the other side shot an arrow into the air at random. In other words, he wasn't even aiming at Ahab. And it said that the arrow pierced the joints of his armor. And Ahab died. He bled to death in his chariot. What Micaiah said came true. But for our purposes tonight, and the lesson that I hope we will all remember was he stood alone by himself, the world against him, the false prophets opposed him. Two powerful kings sitting on their throne. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, whatsoever the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Now I say this to you tonight, and this is the lesson I want to leave with us. We live in a very critical world. We live in very critical times. All you have to do is watch the news on television to learn that Christians are being ridiculed, made fun of, persecuted, some places in the world even uh, being martyred for what they believe. It's not an easy time these days to stand for the right. When everybody else seems to be going the other way. But I want each one of us to have the courage <coughs> of Micaiah and to say, Whatsoever the Lord requires of me, that will I do. Whatsoever the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Amen. And tonight, if you have never obeyed the gospel, you step out before a criticizing world. 
Some people will make fun of you, ridicule you for obeying the gospel. But if you need to be baptized into Christ for a mission of your sins, you're going to have to stand up against all of the powers of the world and of Satan and do what is right. And if you're a member of the church, but you wandered away out there in the forbidden pathway, you need to come back. And you can do that. But just remember that when you do it, it's going to be an act of courage. It's going to be an act that you perform before a criticizing world. But I want you to be able to say within your heart, whatsoever the Lord said unto me, that will I do. And so if you're here tonight and need to respond to the gospel invitation, I want you to come. Make your way to the front. Let it be known what you desire to do. We'll assist you in every way that we can. But even if you're not subject to a public response to the invitation, I hope you will make that commitment in your heart and in your life. Whatsoever the Lord said unto me, that will I speak. While we stand the same. Jesus alone.